Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it to his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here I pray you, this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And lo, my sheep arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheep stood around about and made obstinance to my sheep. And his brother said to him, Shall thou indeed reign over us? Or shall thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. Man, you may be seated. The rest of the scriptures I read will just be strictly for understanding. I want to read Genesis 37 and 19. It says, And they said unto one another, Behold, this dreamer coming. And verse 20 says, Come now therefore and let us slay him and cast him into some pit. And we will say, Some evil beasts have devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. Verse 23, and it came to pass when Joseph was coming to his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. I'll stop right there. If I was to use for a subject this morning, it would be, it's in me. Can you look at a neighbor and say, neighbor, everything I, I need, it's already in me. And so when I'm going to look at this passage, and I will go verse by verse because, like I said, I want everyone to be able to have an understanding. We look at this passage and it opens up and it's telling us about Jacob. And it starts by saying Jacob had sons, but Joseph was what we would call the favorite. Joseph was his most favorite child. And so we come and Jacob was the father of a troubled family. They were riddled with competition and jealousy. 
But we were, but he was Jacob's favorite. In the midst of all this, he was Jacob's favorite because he was the son. He was the son of Jacob's old age. Joseph became Jacob's favorite because he was the son that came in his old age. Joseph was favored because he was the product of a way out of nowhere. Right. And see, as my job, what I do, I'm a nurse. And so you, you look at women who have children, and you look at, you look at men, and the older you get, the, the, the ability for you to be able to have children, it diminishes. And so Joseph comes in the midst of Jacob's old age, and so ja Jacob is in the sense where he says, I know Joseph came by nobody but God. Joseph was the product of a way out of no way. Don't get so focused on where you where you are and who you who you came from that you forget whose you are. Before you had a mother, God knew you. Before you had a father, God had already sanctified you. Before your family made you the black sheep and casted you aside, God had already ordained you. He already knew who you were. It's not about where you come from, but it's all about who you are. You're the possible that rolls up out of that impossible. You're the can that sprouted from that cannot. You're the destiny that grew out of all of that dysfunction. Your elevation, despite all the adversity you face, it shows how favored you really are. You're the product of a way out of nowhere. Favor doesn't mean that everything gonna go your way. And we look and we see, I'm going to get into it, Joseph, he felt like he was in a place that he was so favored that everything would be favorable towards him. But favor doesn't mean everything goes your way. But real favor is when you still come out on top despite all the odds that's been stacked up against you. Because failure isn't an option when you got favor. Every time God makes a way out of no way, it shows me how much favor I have down on the inside. And we come to verse 4 and it says, And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. This was a generational thing. If we study Jacob, who is Joseph's father, East, Jacob's brother Esau hated him. And so Esau hated Jacob. And now we see Jacob's sons. They now, Joseph is now being hated by his brother. It was a generational thing that was passed down. So we can look at Joseph and see Joseph also was the product of a messed up family. His, his, his father's brothers didn't like, didn't like him. And now we get to Joseph and now his brothers don't like him. So Joseph was the product of a messed up family. And real quick, I'm just going to lift the weight off the room real fast. God doesn't care about your genetics. God doesn't care about your genetics. God don't care about your denomination. He doesn't care about your creed or your color or your race because God can still use somebody who's the product of a messed up family because destiny don't have a color. Destiny doesn't have a tax bracket. Destiny doesn't have a genealogy test because destiny belongs to those who belong to the Lord. You ought to just look at a person beside you. You ain't got to touch them. And let them know. Don't be scared of them. And let them know destiny belongs to me. Destiny belongs to me. Destiny doesn't ask what color you are. Destiny doesn't ask how many figures you make annually. Destiny doesn't ask what tax, tax bracket you're in. Destiny doesn't care about what you drive and where you live and what street you live on. But destiny wants to know, do you have the heart to carry the assignment? It don't matter where you come from. It don't matter what your, what's really wrong to your family. So what you got drug addicts in your family? So what everybody in your family is locked up in prison? But destiny, it's your destiny that, that, that proves that you have the heart to carry the assignment that God has put you on. We come to verse 5 and says, And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it to his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And real quick, just to 
brings everybody to the same conclusion. Everything you see doesn't have to be said. We see Joseph, and because of Joseph's favor, and I, I love Joseph, but because of Joseph's favor, we see a sense of pride. He was a little prideful. He knew I'm daddy favorite. Whatever I say, it's going to go. Y'all fall behind me. And so Joseph had a sense of pride. And because of a sense of pride, he lacked wisdom, which caused Joseph to maybe just talk and tell too much. Joseph talked too much, and to speak candidly, and not to make anybody upset, some of us just simply talk too much. We give too much information from the right hand to the left hand. Sometimes silence will be your loudest testimony. Let me say that again. Sometimes your silence will be your loudest testimony and your hardest test. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 and, 7, 1 and then verse 7 says to everything there's a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. And there are some things that God wants to do for us, wants to do for you, he wants to do through you and with you, but you've got to be able to allow God to birth what's in you in a season of silence. You play a dangerous game when you start speaking publicly what God has told you privately. We give the devil ammunition, and it ain't even him, it's simply because we're telling too much. We just talk too much, but sometimes you have to enter into a season of silence. And you have to say, Lord, I know you're working on my behalf. Lord, I know they're talking about me. Lord, I want to say something. Lord, I want to pop off. Lord, I want to go knock on their door. But you have to say, Lord, I'm going to let you handle it because I'm in a season of silence. You continue to work on me. I let you to continue to shake me. I let you continue to mold me into who and what you want me to be. Sometimes you have to put yourself on silence. You have to put yourself in a place where I'm not going to say anything. So we come to verse 19. And y'all just follow me in the word. And it says, and they said one to another. This is his brothers talking to one another. And they say unto one another, behold, this dreamer coming. And so Joseph's brothers, they were mad, but they couldn't deny what Joseph saw. They were in agreement because when he was on his way, they said, here comes that dreamer. So they were mad, but they couldn't deny what he saw. And we can see in his brothers that they didn't have a problem with the dreams. It was the destiny that they had a problem with. They weren't upset because Joseph was dreaming. They were upset about where Joseph said his dreams would take him. And a lot of times, no one is concerned about your route. Nobody is concerned about your route until they see that you have the ability to reach your destination. The devil don't care about you coming in this church as long as you never reach destiny. He don't care about you serving God and helping out at the church as long as you never reach destiny. He don't care about you fasting Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and all day Sunday as long as you don't reach destiny. Because the enemy has a way of making you think that activity equals accomplishment. Because of the truth be told, a lot of us have a lot of activity in Christ, but we haven't accomplished anything in Christ. And most importantly, we haven't allowed Christ to accomplish anything in us. And so Joseph's activity of dreaming didn't bother his brothers as long as he didn't accomplish what he said he would. So a lot of times we got to get our eyes off of who moving the most and who making the most noise and who doing the most in the church because activity doesn't always mean accomplishment because there's some people that's sitting in the back that's on fire for God and some people that are walking here every Sunday, they got a prayer life, they got a fast life because Your activity doesn't always mean accomplishment. And so we come to verse 20 and it says, Come now therefore and let us slay him and cast him into some pit and we will say some evil beasts have devoured him and we shall see what will become of his dreams. And so Joseph's brother set out not to defeat his plans and dreams but to defeat and stop God's word and purpose for Joseph. And so God allows Joseph 
to have limited vision. Joseph didn't know his brothers was going to try to throw him in a pit. Joseph didn't know his brother was going to sell him into slavery. He allowed, God allowed Joseph to have limited vision so that he was so focused on his destiny that he didn't even see that his brothers was trying to detour him. And so Joseph was so focused on the purpose that he never even thought about the process. And a lot of times, God will only show you the end result because if he fills you in on the process, you'll back out and sell yourself short. So sometimes God will show you where you're going without showing you how you're going to get there. Because see, we spoil. We're spoiled saints of God. We're spoiled Christians. And, if, and then we'll neglect purpose to avoid the process. We want the glory, but we don't want to endure the sword. We want the testimony, but we don't want to have any test. We want the message, but we don't want to go through no mess because we are people of God who want purpose, but we don't want process. And so sometimes God will blind you and I'll say, I'm just going to let them go because they're still, if they stay focused on purpose, they won't even think about the process. So you can't neglect purpose because you're afraid of the process. You can't say, God, I don't want to do that. God, I don't want to go there. God, I don't want to say that because you're afraid of how they're going to look at you or you're afraid of what they're going to see. Don't you dare neglect your purpose because you're afraid of process. So we come down to verse 23. And it says, and it came to pass when Joseph was coming to his brother that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many clothes that was on him. And so they stripped Joseph of his representation of favor. His father gave him this coat to show that he was favored by him. And so we come to verse 23, and they have stripped Joseph of his representation of favor, but they couldn't take away his impartation of favor. It was in him. Look at the name and say, it's in me. So they strip his favor, but they can't take away his impartation of favor. The devil, his plan, his desire is that he wants to strip you and make you feel as if there's no hope. And make you feel as if you're helpless, but you're covered by something that he can't touch. The enemy gets mad when he realizes that touching your finances don't touch you. The devil gets upset when he realizes that touching your children and your family won't touch you. It angers the enemy to know that when he touches and twists circumstances and happenstances, it doesn't touch you because you're covered by something that the devil can't put his hand on. You got a hand of protection all around you that's keeping you from the will and the demise of the enemy. You covered by something that the devil can't touch. You may not cross every T and dot every I, but you're covered. You're not where you need to be, but you're covered. You don't look the part, you don't sound the part, but you're covered because you are abiding under the shadow of the Almighty God, and the devil can't touch what he can't get to. And if the truth be told, that's why the devil can't touch some of us. It's because you're covered. It's not because you're so slick. You're just covered. It's not because you're beyond reproach. You're just covered. It's not because you're so special. It's just because you're covered. Gotta look at a neighbor and say, neighbor, I got full cover. I serve a God that can turn any case. He can reverse any curse. He can find any hindrance. Because I'm fully covered by God. I'm covered by God. And verse 23 also notifies me, and it informs me that what's on the outside doesn't always set the standard for what's on the inside. Joseph was given the coat of many color by his father to be an outward display of his favor. So when they took, they took the coat, they, they couldn't take the favor because the coat signified a position of favor. Not a season of favor, a position of favor. And because the days of seasonal favor is gone because seasons come and go. But a position, when you apply for a position at a job, you have to interview. Sometimes you have to be vetted. You have to go through background checks. All of this before they choose to put you in the open position. So I can't 
be moved because I've been dead for this favor. I won't be moved because I've been placed in a position of favor. I'm not in a season of favor, but I'm in a position of favor. I'm in a seat of favor. I'm in a place where no matter what come, no matter what go, I'm standing firm in the favor that's on my life. And I didn't read it. Y'all stick with me. I'm coming to a close. I didn't read it, but I was in Genesis. Genesis 42, verse 8 and 9. From Genesis 37 to Genesis 42, Joseph goes through so much. He's sold into slavery. He's taken in. He gets accused. He goes to prison. He goes through so much from Genesis 37 to Genesis 42. But we come to verse 8. And nine in Genesis 42, it says, And Joseph knew his brother, but they knew not him. And Joseph remembered the dreams which he dreamed of them, and said unto them, Ye are spies, to see the nakedness of the land. Ye are come. So Genesis 42, verse 8, Joseph has now been appointed, and he's, he's, he's sitting over these people. And his brothers come asking, they're in a family, and his brothers come asking for food and for all of this. And when they look at Joseph, they don't even recognize that it's their brother. Joseph knows that that's his brothers, but his brothers are looking at him. And all these years, they don't even realize that that's their brother. And so God didn't leave Joseph in the midst of transition. And God would not leave you in the midst of transition. We see Joseph. He done went through so much. Joseph goes through so much from Genesis 37 to 42, and God never leaves his side. And so what Joseph was criticized for ended up being the reason he was blessed. So keep on talking because it's my vehicle to my destiny. Keep on trying to destroy me because it's my vehicle to my destiny. Keep on judging what I do and don't do because that was propelling me into destiny. This was taking me into my destiny. And I'm going to leave you right here because I've belated the time enough. I'm going to leave you right here. When God, when Joseph, his brothers looked at him, he was unrecognizable. And when God gets through with some of you, when God completes what he's doing with some of you, you're going to be unrecognizable. Because when I was, don't look like where I'm at. Where I'm going, don't look like where I've been. When Joseph came to the room, when Joseph came to be ruled, I can imagine in that moment, Joseph said, no matter how bad I was treated, all this stuff that I went through, at the end of it all, everything I needed was down on the inside of me. And I just came to encourage just a few believers, just a few people that's in the room this morning, that what you need is already in you. From the foundation of this world, everything you need accomplish destiny, God has already placed it on the inside of you. Favor is on the inside of you. That blessing is on the inside of you. Breakthrough is on the inside of you. Deliverance is on the inside of you. New territory is on the inside of you. Elevation is on the inside of you. You ought to encourage three people that's around you and say, it's in you, it's in you. It's in you, it's in you. Everything you need to be destiny is in you. You won't give up. You won't throw in the power. You won't wave the white flag. Because everything you need is on the inside of you. Everything you need, everything God wants you to be is on the inside of you. And what's in me is going to begin to come up out of me when I begin to just stir it up. Ain't nothing happened to you. You just got to stir it up. Like the Bible says, you ought to stir up the gift of God that's not on the inside of you. Everything that God wants for you, everything God has in store for you, you ought to reach out to Him and stir it up. You ought to say, God, wake up everything in me that'll help me be destiny. God, wake up everything in me that'll help me be who you want me to be. That'll help me do what you want me to do.
see y'all. It don't matter what it looks like, it's on the inside of me. No matter what folks say about me, no matter what folks say about you, it's on the inside of me. Hallelujah. We thank God for Gabby. How kind many of blessings you have left this morning? Amen. Hallelujah. Thank Pastor George and First Lady George for being here today. Thank you. Listen, we can't have to serve everybody who here knows the Lord. We want to give an invitation today. Maybe there's somebody here today who's saying, I didn't realize it was in me. And I need to make that connection. I need to be stirred up on the inside. I can't even tell you the only way to stir it up, you gotta put something on the inside. And it'll stir it up for you. Call the Holy Spirit. If you don't know Jesus as Lord, as Master, we want to give you an invitation to receive, to accept him today. See, I've fallen away. I was once in the body of Christ, but I've gone and I've done my own thing, but now I don't want to make it right. If that's you today, I just raise your hands. I just want to give my life to Christ. I want to get back in fellowship with him. Would that be one today? Say, I want to send a free gift of salvation. Hallelujah. Maybe there's somebody today you say, hey, I, I see what GLF is doing. It's been such a blessing to me. I've been coming for months. I've been watching your live. And I just want to partner with this great ministry. If that's you, we just slip it in. Would there be one today? Partnership, salvation, baptism. Every first Sunday we have baptism here. So I want to be baptized. I want to follow the example of the Christ he laid out before us. Would there be one? Amen. I see your hand. I see your hand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can we praise God? Can we praise God? Can we praise God? Hallelujah. Y'all might not get excited about that, but I get excited about that. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Glory to your name. And this sister, she came to me, if it wasn't last Sunday, but the previous Sunday, she said, Pastor, I'm coming. I'm coming. I know why she raised her hand. She said, I got to get busy for the Lord. I just can't sit down on him. I got to get busy. So we thank God for her today, partnering with GLM. Amen. Listen, we're not going to hold you. My sister, we're going to keep with you afterwards. I'm talking about next steps. But it's giving time, GLM. Hallelujah. It's giving time. We want to thank you gifts, and continue seeds, and continue to sow into the kingdom of God. It's, you've, been, you've been such a blessing to this ministry and allows us to be a blessing to the community that God has given us. We know the power of giving. We are giving people. And today I ask that you continue to do that. Give sacrificially. Amen. We're about 30 days away from moving to our new facility. Amen. Can we praise God for that? Yes. We're able to do that because of you who said, I'm going to do my part. You know, some said I give a thousand, some said I give five hundred, some said I give two fifty. Because of you, we're able to do what we're doing. So we ask that you continue to do that. So Father God, we thank you today. We thank you for the word that we've received. Thank you for the reminder, God. Now, God, we ask that you give us a heart to pour into the kingdom. We've got this ministry is about kingdom business. It's not about us. It's not about them. But it's all about you, God. Doing what you want us to do. God, we know that it's already done. You've already laid it out. Like you said, it is finished. Everything that needs to be done is already done. We just have to walk into our destiny. We have to have a ear to you, God. So God, let your people hear what it is that you have for them to sow into the kingdom today. 
Help us to be obedient to the call. God, we ask that you will bless it. We ask that you would honor it. In Jesus' name. Let all of God's people say amen. 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 And amen. If you're the first time here, if you're giving my way on the cash or check, you give on your way out. If you want to give my cash out, it's on the screens and all those other different modes, methods of giving. If this is your first time here, we're not going to ask you to say anything. We just want you to raise your hand. First time at JLF. Amen. One, two, three, four. Can we praise God for our first time? Yes. Uh, everybody stand to your feet. And we're leaving here. I, 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 I'll be preaching at uh, Mount Gilead and the other church. Homecoming. We're leaving there. If you want to follow me over there, amen. We got a word for, from the Lord. Amen. We will thank God for your support. Can we praise God for our youth one more time? Everyone, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I love you. And there's nothing you can do about it. Come on, look at another neighbor and say, neighbor, I love you. And there's nothing you can do about it. May God bless you. May God keep you. Here's our prayer. Go with you.